Good evening and welcome to our East Point History Series Part 2, From Isolation and Transformation, The Struggles and Triumphs of the East Washington Community. We're here tonight and I have some living legends here with me tonight. I am so honored um, to be in the company of such greatness. Let me just say that we are all vaccinated and so you should back up as well. And with the new CDC guidelines, since we are all vaccinated, our masks are here on the table, but we've taken them off. Leaving here is clearly so. We are following guidelines still, and I encourage you again to back up, continue following guidelines as well. But tonight I have some amazing, amazing East Pointers here with me. Um, my co moderator, so I'm being a holiday from America, the great city of East Point, where there's no point like East Point. And my co moderator, Frederick Sheehan, are the first, the first black council member on the East Point City Council, as well as state representative, serve the state representative of our city, great city. Former councilman and former state representative, Joe Haystock. And um, I also have the illustrious, the amazing, the effervescent, former <laughs> first, first black female, first black mayor, first female mayor, and first black female mayor, I believe, in the state, not only in the city of East Point, the Honorable Patsy Joe Hilliard. So they both will be our co moderators on this evening. And tonight, to share with us in their own words what it was like in the East Washington community, growing up in the community, the struggles, the triumphs, and just really sharing history in their own words, are Mr. Samuel Lovett, the senior, who um, was born into the East Washington neighborhood community in 1928. Wow. And is still here thriving with us. And so we're definitely honored to have him to share his experience and his life and his family with us. We also have Dr. Patricia Ann, Patricia Ann Herb, um, whose father was an amazingly impactful community advocate organizer, and really um, supported the youth and really did some amazing things in the community. She'll share that experience growing up in the home with her father and in the East Washington community. And then and we also have Reverend Hosey Terrell, who came to East Point um, Blue Grant Chapel as a pastor, I believe it was in the 1961. And he's going to share with us what it was like being a pastor and also the urban renewal of that. Um, and really kind of taking us through this time period up to around 1979. And so I am truly honored that we are here um, to be able to hear it in our own words, but really to make sure that we are sharing a comprehensive and inclusive history of the city of East Point and people who have lived in this city and just really what it was like um, to make sure that we are not leaving anything out of the history, but really compiling a more comprehensive and inclusive history of our city. Because in order to know where we're going, we must know where we've been to help inform our path forward. And so I am getting chills. I'm so honored to be able to be here this evening in the company of these living legends. And so to start off, we are going to um, share a video montage that really kind of shares during this time period the, a historical montage of some key national um, events and leaders, as well as the East Washington community past and present to where we are now. And then we're going to come back and have a very enlightening, engaging um, conversation and discussion with the living legends who are here with us this evening. So I'm going to pause for just a moment so we can all enjoy this video montage, and then we'll be back shortly yes. to start this amazing discussion.
So I hope you enjoyed that video montage of really sharing some really critical and pivotal parts, points during our history um, as a country, as a nation, with you know, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act being signed, um, as well as national leaders like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Martin Garvey, and all of them. But really, we're talking about, and we shared in there as well, some of the imagery of history in the city of East Point. Um, and so tonight, right now, we're going to shift and focus really on the East Washington community. A couple of things I wanted to lift up before we kind of go into that and segue us into um, Mr. Lovett's discussion with us this evening. You saw in there the um, information about the Sherman March and how that, um, what was going on at that time, and I can tell you during the Civil, right, Civil War and um, the, the leadership at the time, they actually were, were trying to come to the city of East Point, I think it was part of the Battle of Atlanta, but there was a real, I uh, guess they fortified the city, kind of were preferred as you. The city was so fortified that General Sherman made the decision that the area was too heavily fortified to assault and struck and struck the railroad south and west of the city instead of East Point. So East Point avoided a major battle. But in 18, I believe it was 1890, um, the Confederacy still kind of came through the city of East Point because on 1886, 1886, East Point citizens greeted Jefferson Davis, former president of the Confederacy as he traveled by special train from Montgomery to Alabama to Richmond, Virginia, uh, where he addressed the Convention of Confederate Veterans. A group of the citizens erected a large arch over the a and tracks, decorating it with flowers and banners. It was a brief stop, but the grand old man of the lost cause made a speech and personally greeted everyone who could get close enough to shake his hand. And so that was in 1886 in the video I talked about KKK, I think it was around 1865 or um, I forget the date shared in the video. But we kind of come a little further and then 1912, I, I like to share this piece of our history, especially now with the work that we're doing around equitably um, revitalizing and equitably developing our city and making equity including a more than cliche. On July 15, 1912, in the city of East Point at City Hall, the East Point City Council unanimously adopted a ordinance that required all Black people in the city to live in this 45-acre tract of land, which we now know as the East Washington community, near immediately adjacent to three fertilizer plants, a oil plant, and a chemical plant. And the smell was so bad, they literally called it stink town. And the housing was substandard as best at best of shanties. And there was some imagery of that shared in the video as well. And the rationale for the, the um, factory or the mill owners was that they wanted to make sure that the workers were close and work for, late for work. And you know, they wanted to make sure that they could keep an eye on them. So all of these self-serving reasons um, to really have people, black people, not people, all black people in the city live in these deplorable conditions and the minds, of course, from an environmental justice, this is environmental, in unjust um, situations in our city. And that's kind of how the industrialization started. And unfortunately, it is spread to other areas within the city that are near residential as well. And so we're doing a lot of work around environmental justice to rem rem uh, dismantle or remediate or to deal with those inequities that were created in our history. But that was in 1912. And unfortunately, I think we were a trailblazer in Georgia because Atlanta then passed their first red line of ordinance, because that's what that's called until 1913. And the state of Georgia did not amend the Constitution to allow um, red line in the state of Georgia until 1928. So unfortunately, that didn't play the, an unfortunate trail um, as it relates to industrialization and environmental injustice and really this whole red line concept and having people of color live in um, environmentally hazardous conditions. But at, that was 1912, and I just said 1928, the Georgia Constitution was amended, and that was the year 
that Mr. Samuel Lovins, Duke Sr., was born in the great city of East Point, in the East Washington community. And so, Mr. Lovett, in your own words, kind of share what it was like growing up during that time um, and just what you experienced. For me personally? Yes, sir. It was okay because I was a child growing up, and some of the activities that were going on didn't touch me because where we live, uh, I didn't have to go through some of the problems of the things that were going on. But I knew what was going on. Uh, each part of the racial, Control shit. There was no black in government. Uh, the police chief was white, the mayor was white, even the people who picked up bodies. They said that blacks were not intelligent enough to pick up bodies. And what they did is uh, box us in. Almost like a circle. I, I grew up, as the mayor was talking, I grew a circle. And we were on the inside of the circle. And the white surrounded us. So therefore, if you guys break out the circle, you always get to be confronted with the white. And Although we call it East Washington now. But when I was growing up, black people could not live on Washington Street. Washington Street was the divide line between where black people and white. Uh, white people live from Washington all the way back to Jonathan Park. Uh, we had one theater. Uh, at least part of them call it Fatbacks. And we had to buy our chicken on the side, go up the side, and sit up in the log, so to speak, white and sit down. I remember uh, there was one hole there that I don't make it. And Black could not even go in. All the blacks go in there with the young black boy who was sitting up to this. And in those days, they didn't want white boys in there because it was dangerous when the kids flew. It was hit to hit So they put black, young black guys in there. It, it was all the things. Now, that was the last I knew about these part, as I said earlier. Now, I didn't experience it, but I knew about the school of plans. Uh, I knew about uh, how they had a uh, white chain game ball, that's what they call it, chain game ball. When they got ready to expand uh, uh, Washington Street, they had all these black men out there working with ball and chains on with the uh, with the stripes on them. They had their balls, I got to do this, balls, I got to do that. They were prisoners. Huh? They were prisoners. They were prisoners. Were yes, prisoners. yes. And they were getting Washington three dollars. Uh, because all that area was nothing but uh dirty. They had cattle on the street, dog on the street, boy on the street, bear on the street. So, all those were well, most of the black fields, and you had walk on the street, you had one on the street. Uh, all of them, none of them were fake. None of them. Uh, and sometimes when, when it got when it rained, the street was so muddy. Uh, they, uh, you walk on the shoes and you walk on the pair of shoes. Uh, the 
to seek out their mother. And in some time, you kids would get out there and play a uh, bad thing in most years of that. But it, it, it was all the time. Uh, I, I heard about how the Ku Klux Klan that marched down uh, off the street. Uh, and if you know, anyone uh, tried to do anything, tried to protect yourself with a piece of glass. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because they call that black, right? And they would come through and, and be black. And no, I think it was mere, not a mere, I think it was more than black. I think it was a beat down. Right, right. So that, I'm saying that's what they call it, okay. right? Okay. Right? Okay. But, and, 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 and what was interesting also, so I'm, I'm referring to two different sources right now. Um, a little bit ahead in the inception, climax, and transformation of East Washington community in East Georgia. As well as the um, former council member and state rep. Uh, next, I want to announce the centennial chronology of East Point from 1887 to 1987. But I also read that when Martin Luther King was doing his speak, Reverend Martin Luther King doing his speak, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King doing his speak, after those, speak, those speeches, they would come through the neighborhood, the KKK would come through the neighborhood and basically say, don't you don't you in words, getting the idea. Well, I, I'm not aware. Of it. Yes. I, I'm not. I'm not aware. Of it. Okay. Uh, but what I am aware of is that black men would be on the corner, uh, and the white policeman would come by and just walk in that corner. You mean that you 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 left it? You didn't leave. We we don't need it. Uh, lock you up. That's a significant point. I might add something to what you said. It's amazing that, that we see that same controlling racism in East Point. I grew up in New York City. Mm -hmm. And they did the same thing to us in the 40s and 50s. Right. That's one of the reasons that I've talked to a number of people about. You develop a disdain for some police officers, mainly the white police officers at that time. We had the same experience. Give me that corner, nigga. I'm, uh, I'm not going to hide that. Yes, I use that term, and it's a principle, so I think. Right. But don't worry, that's what they said. I'm not going to back up for that term. Right. But police for harm. And, and think about it now. Some of them quietly still are. Mm -hmm. Well, you said quietly, I would be out of the In some cases, they. That's true. Look, look, uh -huh. That's true. And you know, it's funny you said something else that triggered another comment, and I apologize about the man. You know, it's funny that. Um, the thing talk about the chain gang. The chain gang was a sophisticated form of slavery. If you think about that. Now you talk about they couldn't legally enslave you, but when they needed certain work done on the highway or the streets or certain done in some of the municipal uh, buildings or state or office buildings or whatever, they would get the people in the chain gang to do those things. And these men had ball and chain. I remember as a little boy riding down the street, uh, down the highway, and seeing these men in balls and chains. How did that make you feel knowing that you were that was a form of slavery at that time? How did you feel as a black man? I know it must have touched you so somewhat deeply to know that black people were still in chains. Well I have no big money at the time. Good for you. Good for you. Good for me. I, I can say this and without any hesitation. I have never been a friend of black. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. Never have been. I believe in the law. We've been born in uh, obeying the law. But nobody, I never thought anyone would come up to me and hit me and I would hit back. And maybe that's one reason my father's protected. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it was bad for black people. So it's about a different neighborhood. Well, the neighborhood, we had several, several uh, uh, different neighborhoods. We had uh, gravel that ran over, over there where uh, the hospital is now. That was the black section. They had a black church over there. You know, you have to search. They were the black church. You had uh, uh, Newtown, Everton, up in the hospital. You had uh, Shanghai. That was the Lord's head. Oh. We had 
the healing and follow up for the new grand chapter of the church. Then you had seven times. Uh, that's where uh, South Korea and Calhoun, Warren Street, North Street, and they are the exception. Now, there are some areas in East Point. Uh, I don't know where you look at Martel Hall now. Mm -hmm. Martel Hall was a little strip, one street, little house on the other side. And Martel had a condo. And nobody ever left white. And if black people go there, they get thrown out. They were white people are called tanks. Uh, he always had to run black but when he came to the black section, he go to the back back, he had to run too. But in the early points, they moved uh, the white people from Montel Hall to the train. The graveyard. The graveyard. Okay. He brought the black from the graveyard to work in the mill down there to the East Point. Mm -hmm. That's probably part of my tail home. And my tail home is named after a white person? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you had John Cook. Yeah, John Cook on the left of St. Catherine. What was that with the Red Terrible? Oh, the people that were out there. It was awful. You for me, you said gravity? Yes. Of course, sir. Yes. The young people were out there. Well, that was a chemical was a community. Yes. Oh, yes. And these, all of these communities were within the East Washington community, right? In that area of town. No, no, no. East Washington was known from Washington Street back toward Jefferson. Okay. So, so you, you shared a lot about kind of like early childhood and the different neighborhoods. You mentioned the Fox Theater. Um, the Fairfax Theater. Fair 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 Fair. I'm thinking Fox is in the room. <laughs> the Fairfax Theater. Um, tell us about, you were in the Boys Scout Troop. Um, there was no public transportation at the time, and then kind of this idea when you went to high school and your your friends that's going to Okay, let me, let me, uh, this should be a way for us to get there into that system. Uh, and the white was to bring it because the black city no, is up there. Because we should be able to get an output coming from the computer. It built a number of these. Uh, 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 you call the rough boy and rough and uh, uh boy and rough high school. And that the black people go. Now uh, in 1940, the Captain New Grand Council came uh representing black uh as and he and uh but they got together and they came together and formed the great black one got and my birthday was in June. I came June of 12 that year. And I was born the first class uh, uh, Wilson Gibbs, I was in class uh, South Mexico. Uh, we had very good Scout too. And most of us drove. Uh, at least the first class shot. That was called the World War II Cable. The World War II Cable uh, 
person who the people already know there was in China. So what's that to the council as the all that would. Wilson Head, Wilson Head was one of the, uh, he was a Boy Scout troop, he had gone to, uh, I think it starts with Mark Brown, he transferred to Tuskegee, and uh, he was one of the prominent family. And he refused to go to the military? Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Yeah. Conscience is objective? Right. Well, I like that. Well, he was very but, nice with that, too. Pardon? He was recognized for that. Yeah. Oh, he was? Yes. 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 Hayfield, Calmetta, Fallon, uh, and a lot of Cascade, all of those places. Huh? Video. 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 They had to come to East Port. They went to the uh, cemetery. They came to East Port from the cemetery to the next day. Then left uh, East Port to the next day to one. To pay for a lot of drinks. But there were several of us. You know, they came, they could go to bed, they could go to see. You know, Holy Church, Sun, Williamsville, myself, we wanted to play football. So I had my mom and dad put out the house. They called it. That's where they went. So we went to Howard High School. And we played football, and it was not for the point really for how the football team was now. <laughs> then I helped out to go to Washington, and I ran into Washington down at the club. And it was a lot of it. So, so you had some good friends, that's Thorn Hill and uh, oh. Clifford Barnett. And well, then tell me about the black only swimming pool. Yeah, I, I, I knew Gus uh, all the right. time. I knew his father, Reverend Brownville. And Gus practiced. Uh, there was, uh, there had been four black funeral homes in each other. Most of the people don't know that they had also funeral homes. Mm -hmm. And he was on the corner of uh, Brandon Street to George Avenue. He had Cox Brothers. They were on the corner of Parker and Bill Street. He had Lyle Sims. Then he had Walker Pillow. And Gus uh, was trained by Mr. Walker. That's when he was so great. <laughs> <laughs> he was trained by Mr. Walker. And when they hired the great uh, policeman, it was Gus Thornhill and uh, 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 the name of the uh, Barnett. Now, I, I remember once I got out of the military, my brother, one of my brothers, was working at the same time. And he said, Why don't you get a job in the post office? So I did, I, I passed the test, I started working uh, in Atlanta. Sometime in 19, uh, I'm thinking in 15, 55, 55, I got a call from the postmaster here in East Port. Someone coming in for an interview. I went in. So, when they called me, they went in. He said, well, Who are you? I told him, Well, who do you want? Well, you said to me. <laughs> and he said, What's your name? I told him. And I told him, What? Well, I said, Paul. And he told me, He said, I cannot hire you after that. Yeah. 
say, if I were high you, that's the left area, I'll lose right now. Every day you put five. He said, but I'll tell you what I will do. I will hire you as a judge. I moved around to all the fellows. I knew they were going to the fall. But anyway, he said, I'll hide you as a judge. He said, one day they're going to hide the color, color people. And you'll be the first one. <laughs> one day. And I, and I said to him, no, sir, thank you. And he said, you turning that girl down? Yes. Why? I said, because I'm already in the other area now. And blew his mind. So it, 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 was, it was just so racial. When people, when people look at uh, the race issue today, they think it's bad. Not a bad thing. Thank you. 
teaching classes. I hide in my classes. When I looked up, who were my instructors? Garfield Gates. And I didn't know what to call him Mr. Gates. He didn't know what to call me Mr. Lucky. So I've been calling him all my life. So that, that, that's how souls it was. But I, I, I just want to, I, I don't think the black folks you know, they actually, I hear a lot of black people are still the white folks. Wow. Wow. Everybody's going to be interrupting right now because just sitting here, Brother Lovett, I'm really impressed to hear what you say because for the most part, those of us that were paid through the 60s, you know, thought we were brash, somewhat arrogant, somewhat, you know, non passive. We thought all of your generation was somewhat passive. But by being here, you now saying you are taught by your father to be a strong black man. Absolutely. And I think one of the things I used to tell my uncles, I used to call them Uncle Tom. They were so proud to go to the military. Father, they called them battle little bowls and what they did in the military. And they were with Patton. I said, you guys are just a bunch of Uncle Toms. And they're dead now. I wish I could beat them up and apologize. But to see a strong black man like you really, really tells me that our people had opened and got to where we are now. Because of strong black men like you. And I am so happy to be sitting next to you. And I know that we have to talk to Pat and I have to talk to uh, Reverend Gerald. But man, I am really, really impressed with you being a strong black man. It is fun. Amen. And I think that's, that's, a, great, that's a great point, right? It's fun about it. Yeah, you hit it on it as well. I love it. So I'll around. So. We have these perceptions yeah. around. Yeah. Yeah. What it was like, or yeah. people being living in fear, and I mean, Mr. Lovett just shared, hey, he he didn't fear nobody. No. He never feared. No. He never feared a white person. He respected all people. His dad and his parents didn't give him this like playbook of you know don't do this. <laughs> what to do is just respect every human being. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that I, I really like. We said we didn't have never we had community. Like that's powerful, right? And you talked about the sewing circles and so on. Turn over to Dr. Heard, and, and her, her father, OJ Heard, um, was really a, a community activist advocate. Um, really started a bus service for blacks from Central Avenue to East Washington. Just an impactful person in the community. So, Dr. Heard, what was it like growing up with OJ Heard and your mom and your siblings and just being in? Yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't know the difference. Um, my, um, I remember, well, I was born in 1940, so that's, that's, but I remember uh, when I was young, the streets weren't paved, you know, very much. Uh, I think when I got about eight or nine years old, some of the streets, I know you can get there. I'm, I'll get there. No problem. <laughs> some of the streets were paved. Um, but I think all railroads are called all railroads. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, that area was not there. Now, by the time I got to high school, most of the streets in East Point were paved, but we had no sidewalks. And I remember my dad put a sidewalk in front of our house. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
The reason I said it is that um, my mom and my dad were married in 1937. And on this program, she is listed as Miss Ruby Chung. And uh, she taught the fourth grade. She, the, she was the fourth grade person. And my aunt, Miss Ann Chung, taught the seventh and third grade. And the principal was Professor F. S. Capel. So, how did that go there? It was interesting, Dr. Kirk. You just reminded me, your mother and father taught him. No, no, no. My own heart for him. Yeah. yeah. Which is a wonderful connection. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Um, so let's see. Um went to he he was mentioning that the school stopped at what eighth grade? Uh at ninth grade. Ninth grade. And then you had to go to uh, wow. eleven yeah. to high school. Yeah. Well, I went to East Point Elementary School and it didn't stop. So I went from the first grade to the seventh grade, East Point Elementary School. Uh, and then from eighth grade to twelfth grade to the South Pole High. When I was there, they changed the name just before I entered because it used to be East Point High School. So it became South Pole High. Um, uh, let's see what else can I say. Um,
happy day for me when I was practicing that whole time. But and also, and also, it's a full father and they want to make sure that he's just way more than that. Oh, yeah. So, you know, the Bible is just about anything about it. I'm not going to apologize for it. You can find anything about it just about what it is you want to do. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I think that's a lot of what we are doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And faith. But we mentioned um, there was a lot of sports, and we had sports and the amateur baseball team. That was just cool in the video as well. East Point Bears, East Point White Sox, the Swiss Black Caps, and East Point All Stars. And um, your father was very instrumental in, in the baseball field. And then we had John D. Young, of course, he went on to play Baker Lee and a number of others. I, I want to bring into the conversation before we go to Dr. Carroll. So there's two things I want you to talk about the your role in the East Point Black History Board that you commissioned or led by um, former Mayor Hilliard. But let's talk about the swimming pool situation, <laughs> right? I, I was it was yes. I, I want us to get there because I, I know we, we've been tired. this is good. I'm really enjoying it. So there was a and it was in the video. There was a white only swimming pool. And then there was a black swimming pool, and, and what was shown on the video as well is like that town over in part of the area where Johnny was on the park was a black swimming pool. But there was a white swimming pool, and the location was where the East Point Historical Society currently sits, yeah. right? So I know um, Reverend Terry came in 1961, so either Mr. Lovett or, and, or Reverend Terry, like, let's, let's talk about that, and then we'll get into the black people. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I want to miss one other thing. Okay. Going back, um, that was a, my father and group of uh, South Coast and Boosters Club. They established a uh, um, little league uh, for the black um, for young men in the East Point area. And so, uh, this is a letter I got something else to Wow. Uh, wherein they could not play in this area. So this is a letter inviting the Little League from East Point to Washington, Pennsylvania to play with uh, their team in the Keystone region. So this is another. What year was that? This was 1960. Wow. Yeah, this is a letter. So they could play in Pennsylvania, but they couldn't play in Georgia. They play here. Wow. Because it's so good. Wow. Yeah. All right. That's my question. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> and your family did a lot. And we want to thank your family, too, for making it possible for a lot of us to be here. Yeah. And we probably, we took a lot of the way. We all did a lot. So we're sitting here now, thank you. We need to thank you and others all that you did. Yeah. And, and we probably still doing Thank you. We uh, talked about this pony baseball league. I know it was something that jarred our memory. It was in 1960. And this letter is dated May 4, 1960. Um, South and Booster Club created Pony and Little League teams. And the Pony team teams kept kids active in sports and out of trouble. They were on the Pony team. team. And they called them Pony because the city said Little League was the term white used for the real Little League. Wow. So they had to be Pony baseball because the Little League was reserved for others. Mr. Mr. Lovett. Baseball, swimming pool. No, the terrible well, was going to say something. Oh, I need to say something about the swimming pool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so cool. Cool. Okay, as you said, there were two, two different swimming pools. So I think I don't know, I remember the professional college. I decided that I didn't like the swimming pool on the Madden Street. I decided I want to go swimming in the white swimming pool, which is now under the uh, East Point Historical House. So I did go. I took to get in, but then the former Dick Lane was the uh, uh, reparation person. So he came and he said, if you get in that swimming pool, I'm going to arrest you. So I didn't get in the swimming pool, but I did try. <laughs> now, that's it. Wow. <laughs> well, we're out of front. We didn't even go hear that. But I think it was in the 50s, the last day of the circus, 
they did just do a two-wheel rally street. Mm -hmm. Uh the name of uh, Charlie Green. Green. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was pretty real pretty cool. That black head in the area. But prior to that, uh there used to be three streams of water that ran in the back of the mm -hmm. One ran down by grandma. One like Jolly Foot, the one behind the corner behind the hall. And the one that went down gravel came into a bay and the pilot was uh the only one. They would go out there with pigs and shovels, they would dig it out, they put that dirt to say in the trouble bag. Not a little trouble bag, son. <laughs> no, Jerry, you know what we're talking about, all right? Yeah. And what you used to put potatoes in the old bag. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Oh, the sack back then. Okay, all right. Yeah. Bag for the city church. Okay, yeah. Now we're going to go. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what they would do is dig it out and they would put dirty sand in them, they would put rocks, they would dig them up this area and they would, they had a pastor that was up high that came down and we would go down there and we go, go skin it. Everybody in that pool. Uh, you couldn't let you have let young girls down there. Oh, that's all you We can bug in. But it was fun. It was fun. The simple thing, right? And uh, Union Baptists used to, when they were baptizing, they would be on there and put a grandma. Mm -hmm. And after they would be baptized two or three times. So, mm -hmm. so Luke, um, Mr. Leonard talked about baptism, Reverend Terrell. I'm, I'm going to pivot to you for the, the faith experience. So you came here as a pastor of New Grand Chapel in, or Grand Chapel in 1961. What was that like and kind of how, what was the impact of urban renewal? I can remind you that there was a room there. You would never say that before. I got a report. Report. <laughs> anyway, my wife and I were appointed to Old Grand Town in 1961. They really want to come. Nobody wanted to come to Grand Town in those days because the local that's speaking Grand Town was in a terrible mess. Well, that, that, that's what I want to say, that doesn't belong to this meeting, but it's a the best. So the bishop said, yeah, he will. was the principal, number one friend, uh, my father, was the principal of South Wales. Can you speak up just a little bit? We want to make sure everybody can hear you. Speak up just a little bit. It's, it's going to catch you just speak up just a little bit louder. Okay. But anyway, anyway, if the word said to me, son, I want you to go and stay in my church. And I said to him, where is the church located? I'm going to see if that question. I said, I'm not going unless you tell me what the church is going to be. You need to say, you need to say, you need to say, you need to say, you to say, you need to say, you need to say, you need to say, I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> but the 
Dave never, Dave never sat. It's a way you care on that food there. You need to go in. Well, back then, that was not only <coughs> way you do, but you had a side. And, and uh, if you could put a little bridge over the bridge, you could have preached. <laughs> But there were a little more like I came on these front edges in the morning. And uh, I saw a need, I did, get involved in politics. But the name Jack Cooper was the number one black politician in those days, so I, I, I got involved. I will never get. I think I mentioned that early on. I said, Brother well, Jack, you can't fight what you're trying to become. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought about that early on when he was about you. You were know, scared. I would have never said a white man. No, never. Even when I was born, 14 miles from the slave market, it grew it to the door. But I would never see it as a white man. But anyway, I got involved. And the old city I'm already put back in there. Right after everything. So I made it my business to come up to the city council one night. And the neighbor of an older city who was the mayor of each point of that time took to me and said, Preacher, what you want up here? I said, well, Mr. Mayor, I didn't come to take over your city. But whatever privileges you went to, I ran into your office. And we had a back to preach again. But they didn't. Don't tell me who did that. But they, for some reason, were afraid to get involved. They were black people were still white people. I said, I'm going to get involved. And I got involved in the political aspect, first, of the community. There he is, the church. I found out about the church that night. And I made a statement out of the so you mind resigning, uh, get back so we can get a uh, black person in the city council. He's looked at me and that's why he said, Yeah, and that's when we agreed to do that. But that's so all that that night. Yeah, what happened is when I came down, in fact, I was sharing with you when I first came to East Point from New York in 1971. I look for the leadership in our community. You, James Jackson, Dr. Hurd, I don't know if you remember. Dr. Hurd was, was one of them. It's like four, three or four or five. Dr. Hurd was one, right? And of course, I came to you guys to ask what we could do to you know, get, get organized. And that's when we started organizing on the west side of town. Because up in that point, there was no organization on the west side. But with, with, with your encouragement, we saw it. Pardon? You got elected. Thanks a lot of you, yes. Yeah. But, but they 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 did not have been in it. But white people had not had to elect. They got together. I was a good Negro. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but they got together to run me out of this one. Mm -hmm. And this I have not said until the night. And you had number two Baptist preachers in each point at that time. Maybe for that to sign on. I heard a lot of that uh, e ride. Mm -hmm. They joined the white people to run me out of here. This is a statistic. But anyway, I said, I'm going to hang in here. And when the time
time and for they were good time to get in the God. It was when Dr. Martin Luther King and the group of people marched on Richard. You remember Richard in the outside? Well, you went in anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, I was stupid at Brown at that time. So I go in the, uh, the, the, the bar. And we bought it until we got down to the site and uh, Mitchell Street. There was a white man standing over there and he thought, I'm like, you can't go along. So I got out. Yeah, there was a priest by the name of Rev. Benny. He was a member of the Weekly Baptist Church. Did you tell him? He said, yeah. He said, yeah. He said, yeah. He said, why? I said, Benny, if that white man stood on me, he ain't going to get on nobody. And I got up. I didn't know then. He was right. Martin Luther King Jr. and I were going to the same year, 1929. But you had you to have a cafe over there on Virginia Avenue called the Mars. The Mars. Not the big of the big of the Mars. My wife and I went over there one time for lunch. And I did, you know, sometimes it's good to be who did who got something to be said if you don't know that. So I was to make my business to get acquainted with Dr. J. Mm -hmm. He kept on talking. His second church as a Baptist preacher was in East One. Mm -hmm. He said, Son, I said, Yes. Martin Luther, Jim, and he was not a member of this preacher. Now, I mean, just last year, you before that. What we have? Mm -hmm. Now, he wasn't Catholic. Mm -hmm. You talking about the one preacher? Preacher Adam? Not a Catholic. You talking about Preacher Adam? Was that Henderson? No, 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 no. But anyway, anyway, Dr. King said to me, he had heard about what was about to happen. He said something out there. Don't let. He was talking about his own party. Don't let Junior, he called Junior. Don't let Junior and the rest of them take you to And you may be fine. You do what needs to be done and all be done. So, hold the scene. So I called about nine o'clock. No, I called him about twelve o'clock that night. And he said, Preacher, I said, Yeah. I told him, I'd like to have a meeting with you. He said, When? I said, Now. Nah. I couldn't get Davy, I couldn't get Mark, I couldn't get Don Richter. The only preacher I could get to come up here with me was the Reverend Henry Evans. He was. He said, "I ain't scared here. I ain't scared. That's all." So we go up and talk. And at that point, he he wanted to have a seven car on the road. And all seven cars were parked right over there. Seven of these cars. Two Baptist preachers. <laughs> I mean, one Baptist, one AMA. Those guys, I one of them upstairs. They say, how are you? So, what was the man that he became a man after that? Fun, you know? Fun. He was a preacher, but you all alone. I said, well, no. Mr. Mayor, I said, Mr. McMister, I just don't see him there. I said, Mr. Mayor, they get ready to march on Blue City tomorrow. Blue City, yo. So 
And I think this is going to help people who are listening because of what we're going to do now. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, it's nothing new. Yeah. Well, you know what they say, they have nothing new under the sun. Yes. And we are, we are, we know that. Those of us who have lived long enough have seen it revolve and revolve. Uh, all they do is they, they fall, they fall. Yeah. But, but another thing now, that was a, a, a good side of each one of you. Mm -hmm. uh, a good side. So the good side of this one. You can buy anything you want to buy right here in the show. I bought my first two cars. That's right. A lot of car dealers, right? Well, you know, Robert Taylor used to talk about knowing that to sell in large and just sitting in the yard at the right time. And then that was a big song. He was in there. I got way too many to do that. We would have on each one. We had each one of the streets, but we weren't allowed on the back then. We had each one of the streets, but if you had. Two week traffic. I wait for the night. I'm going to do each part, trying to call the radio, bam, 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 but that was the good side. And once you became acquainted with one or two of the good life degree, you had to make it. You know, the week that Mr. Wood sent me, so to speak, the East Point, they didn't know who I was, but I was driving them to put a life in the car. And then I moved out there in the car. I would come out here and crash and then go back to the world and get a car. Oh, yeah. Fair home there. I think that police was still with me. But everybody, what did you have your first job? How did you have your first job? And the brothers. Who? We're brothers. I don't know. So the connection, so Mr. Love, it was taught by your mom and aunt, and you had your first dinner as a pastor in their house. Your brother Ben, about five or six of them, and they were sent outside. And wait until I tell them so they go walk in to her home at night. And I said, You know, you're not gonna do it. You, know, you walk in to her home at night, you're gonna come in the church. You're gonna put someone on the street. <laughs> <laughs> I'll return. I'll return. My name is Lisa. I think it's a building so we can have an easement. And once they allow we don't have any monuments to take down. No, well, we had one. Uh, but it was on private property. And it was on East Point Street. There's, there, there's a stone. Yeah, I'm just reading so much sense. There's a bit of a difference. It was made all right. There's a stone at Bryce's construction on, on Main Street. And it had Jefferson Davis Highway. When the, when the um, you know, the protest and the world outcry after George Floyd murder last year took place. Someone brought it to our attention, so I reached out to the owners of the business, and they were like, sure, black owners, right? They're like, sure, we'll take it down. And so then they thought about it. They said, well, we would like to put art on it. But what they did was, like, some kind of way had the insignia, the what was engraved on it, removed. Okay. So now it's still a stone there, but it doesn't have the re reference to Jefferson okay. Davis. As I said in 1886, the citizen, he was the president of the Confederacy, he came through here, right? So um, that was the only one. And they immediately addressed it and we'll mention have some art on it, but you're right, Mary. Like, um, this is enlightening for me because there is a, there's a perception of, you know, the 
of race relations that are the same wherever you are, right? And, and we've heard like different contexts of what it's like um, to live in the city and although it was segregated and with the red line and all those things, kind of like the day they like. And so, you know, this has been rich. Mayor, I, I want to. Um, I'm not the Yes. And what was the urban renewal? What did it do? And what was Right. would be left standing and that the new ones would be built to replace those 
beyond rehabilitation. Uh, we were assured that no one would have to change their place of the board before new homes were built. However, what happened was because there were no new homes built, many of the people who had homes in, in that side of town had to leave. They left and went somewhere else. There were some people who stayed, like my family, um, other families. They stayed and um, built their own homes. They had to build their own home. Um, actually, the home that I, part of my life I do up here is, is on the corner of uh, Bell. In fact, they took the homes that I grew up in on, and made Bell Avenue. Right. The part of the old home is still along the left of the right hand side of Bell Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we were able to get our own contractor, he was white, but he built, he built big, home, built big homes, uh, nice homes. Um, we were only able to get one lot. They were going to sell us one lot. However, he was able to buy five lots. And he built one, two, three, four, five houses on the corner of on Bell Street. The only house that, uh, the Ross house at the corner, was built by Mr. Whitaker, who was, who was black, and he was uh, from Paris Park. So that's a little something about it. Well, that's a little point. <laughs> Economic segregation. Yeah. That's a classic example. One one house or one lot for black people and five for white. It is they can buy it. Yeah. So, buy it. so we're talking about economic, we're talking about economic uh, uh, segregation back then. Right? And, and the wealth gap, right? So like yeah. all on the support. So that was the point I was bringing. Uh call the black people black people together. Yeah. To discuss the idea of building a crow, the big star, right out there. Right out front of the city house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, with Cleveland Avenue and Bay, you got some open land that time. Right. Who's laying out of the hole? Yeah. The yeah. whole thing. Mm -hmm. Other way, you can read the downtown east point of that room. People who come, they got to We're building something for them to do. Yeah. We're going to create a destination for them to come to. Again, I'm part of our downtown. But anyway, I told the community, you remember a man by the name of Joe Scott? He was there. He but anyway, we met to put together a program to build our children for black, right out of our plan tree. So we enjoyed that for a little bit of the game in three weeks from now. So we met back, and he said, I used to be about it. I've been thinking about something. Let's need it over and over again. Because uh, who going to hold the money? Who's going to hold what you have me? Now, that, what, that still exists among black people. Now, we don't treasure doing what we can to help others really to grow. Yeah. Uh, Find me a convenient store in each point that's operated by white sunlight. Okay. You got these farms, you know. Now, I'll give you know, we could have, we could have owned some of these convenient so they, and they put them anywhere they could see one in, they put them in there. And, 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 and we'd like to put a store in the black community. So we don't have that. Yeah, we, we definitely have to say. So, so I, this has been rich. 
Um, we can we can be here like all night, and I can continue to absorb and take some good notes. <laughs> okay. We move from this point to kind of that, which is far worse than evil. <laughs> but anyway, when we move back to the deep point, they have fun with that. Every day, they have deep point, and even they still have the freedom of the internal plan. We move back to each point, and they have left. Why did you move back to East Point? The truth of the matter is, Mr. Mayor, I moved back to East Point because if I met the angels, but they say I'm going to pick me up, I'd be told to the airport now and get the plane.
the horn picture. So the boy said, oh, go ahead, I'm going to go check this one. I'm going to go eat it here when you get back. Yeah. <laughs> he joined me a good time to eat it. I'm going to be back. So we have sent the young lead bulb now on the cuts, the black bear. There were several cuts. So we got all of these boys now. Mm -hmm. All of them. The army of the army of the city right there. All the army of the city right there. All the army of the city right there. Yeah, with that in mind, I'll ask the pastor, the beloved sister, Dr. Hurd. I'm in the church all my life, so I don't know anything about her. So you might want to go ahead and know. Yeah, so so this is good. This is good. We will we will have a part three. Um, the part three will continue the conversation about like the history of East Point during this time period, and, and a more a, a multicultural conversation will be good. inviting um, former council member Cameron Sutton, um, former council member Cameron Barth, and as well as reach out to Claire Faith, who had the first um, drugstore on Washington Road, pharmacy they call it Faith Drug. Um, and there's Betty Pierce who got married really involved with Beast One Beautiful. And she established Beast One Beautiful. She Beast One And her husband was an accountant. So they'll be able to share their perspective with Jane Gunson. Um, life ministries. And so we're going to continue to have this opportunity to have living legends share in their own work. So we talk about history. It's not just about reading it, but we are honored and, and, and blessed to be able to have this living legend still among us. We want to be able to hear it and hear history in their own words. So Mary Hilliard, Brett Pexall, if you guys want to say a few words to close us out. I think we will say, I want to call you. I need to have a word with you that I can close with those. Okay, okay, no problem. And there is a new rule right there in Newport.
former Mayor Patrick Joe Hill, your former council member and former state representative Joe Hexall, as well as the living legends of Samuel Lovett um, Sr., as well as Dr. Patricia Ann Hurd and Reverend Hosey Terrell. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I have learned so much this evening. And I have a different perspective of really kind of what it was like um, to be in the city of this point during a time where there was a lot of racial tensions and racism and you know a lot of different things happening. We heard from three strong women living legends who said we weren't fearful, we had fun, we did things, and we you know were able to really thrive. Um, Mr. Lovett talked about the businesses, and so there was really um trying to there were there were a major success stories during this time and so thank you thank you thank you thank you for joining us this evening for providing this perspective and we will continue to share more of these points history um series part three june 11th the second friday in june will be when we'll share part three we'll be looking at from trailblazers to transformation and i shared the um the guests, the living legends that will be invited to join us, that the, it will include the people I mentioned, and we might even have some more. But this is an opportunity to make sure we are sharing a confidence and inclusive history. We must know our past in order to know where we're going. And we are creating, and we'll have this point be a destination city where people will have things, stuff to do in our downtown, um, live, work, play. Shop stay a safe, vibrant, thriving, just, equitable, equal community. The great city of East Point, where there's no point like East Point. So make sure you continue to um, join us for these very engaged, enlightening sessions of learning more about East Point history. Thank you so much. Make sure you stay safe. Backs up again. The reason we are not masked is because all of us have been vaccinated in the new CDC guidelines just came out on Thursday, yesterday, um, that said if you're indoors and everyone is vaccinated, you can. We also only have very few people here. Um, so we are definitely making sure that we're still prioritizing our health welfare and safety. And I encourage you to do the same. Back up, you know, wear your mask, wash your hands frequently, and make sure you wait at least six feet away from people when you're out. The guidelines are loosening up, but the more people that get vaccinated, the more we'll be able to get back to what we consider normal before the pandemic. But I can continue to assure you that we will get through this together. So thank you so much for joining us and good night, East Pointers.